Good afternoon, good morning, and welcome to this webinar, Defining and Executing a Piracy Management Strategy Through Cutting-Edge Technologies and Services, hosted by Digital TV Europe and sponsored by Viaccess Orca. I'm Stuart Thompson. I'm the editor of Digital TV Europe. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to explain how you can participate in today's presentation. First, if you have uh, any technical difficulties during the session, please press the Help button on your player console to receive assistance in solving any common issues. Um, also, we welcome your questions during today's event. In order to submit a question to the presenters, simply type it into the question window on the right-hand side of your screen and then hit Submit. We'll be answering as many questions as possible during the Q&A session that follows the main presentation, but please feel free to send in your questions at any time and we'll add them to the queue. Um, so if at any time you are having audio difficulties or difficulties advancing the slides, simply hit the F5 key to refresh your webcast console. Please also be aware that today's sessions are being recorded and they will be available on the Digital TV Europe website beginning from tomorrow for you to review. You'll be notified by email when the archive is available. <clears throat> so let me now introduce today's presenters. Um, Dr. Guillaume Forban is CSO at Viaccess Orca. Uh, Dr. Forban is the Chief Security Officer. His role is to ensure that VO provides best of breed technologies, solutions and services addressing current and future piracy threats. He aims to assist VO partners design and implement efficient security and anti-piracy strategies to safeguard their brand, business and revenues. He was previously Director of Platform and Content Security at OSN, leading pay TV network in the MENA region headquartered in Dubai. Prior to OSN, he led the Walt Disney Company's content security efforts throughout EMEA. Um, and he's also participated in the development of multiple Sajincom devices as well as Sony Bravia TV sets. Um, Guillaume holds PhD in computer vision from the University of Surrey as well as an MSc in Computer Science from the University of La Rochelle. Kevin Lejanik is Director of Marketing Security at Vaxis Orca. Uh, Kevin is a Product Director um, Security and is in charge of security services. In the past, he worked on new content protection techniques based on Vaxis Orca's DRM while leading IoT and virtual reality programs. Before joining VO, he worked for several years for Technicolor and then Boog Telecom on the, devel the development of IPTV portals and middleware. Kevin holds a master's degree in computer science and networking from ISEP, the École Supérieure d'Ingénieurs de Paris Est. Um, so with that, let's begin the webinar. Kevin. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Stuart, and uh, hello, everyone. I guess that many of you have read this shocking but very true speech from Beansport CEO Youssef Alobaili while he was speaking at the Leader Week Summit in London a few weeks ago. He said, the glorious media rights bubble is about to burst, and the truth is that our industry is completely unprepared. He added that the endless growth of sports rights is over, and now Beansport regard all sports rights as non-exclusive and that their commercial offers will reflect that. This is the result of the BIOQ piracy Beansport has been facing for the past few years. But to me, this speech could be also the start of a new awareness in the TV industry. Maybe Mr. Alobaldi was preparing the ground for future commercial negotiation with right owners, but more than that, he was trying to raise awareness among the industry, to show right owners and right holders that they can no longer bury their heads in the sand and that they need to join forces and fight piracy. Because even if BIOQ is one very specific case and does not represent global piracy, all content owners are now in the midst of a severe crisis if they let piracy grow. So the goal of this webinar will be to find, uh, to first, sorry, describe this new piracy context and then to explain how to build an effective anti-piracy strategy to protect content rights. So let me start with these first figures showing the so-called billion dollar content race. For the past few years, we've seen a tough streaming war between cord cutters and pay TV operators who are spending billions of dollars to acquire exclusive content. In the past eight years, 
um, the number of shows grew by something like 129%. And if we aggregate sports and movie series, the total amount of money spent on content acquisition every year is close to $150 billion. While in the music industry, we had new actors like Spotify and its competitors who could aggregate all this premium content under the same application, under the same offer, it's the complete opposite for uh, the video industry. And all these actors competing together are creating a huge um, 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 huge complexity and, and many, many offers um, that the end user has to subscribe to. So for the end user, it means that he has to pay for a dozen of subscriptions. He had to subscribe to dozens of different applications if he wants to watch all the content he's interested in. If I take the example of friends, if an end user wants to watch all the soccer games of one team, he has to subscribe to Beansport, to Canal Plus, to RMC Sport, and to Eurosport. And even if that end user has the money to buy for all, to pay for all these uh, services, at the end, the experience is not that good because you will have different application UIs, different ways to search for content. So for sure, he's going to be disappointed. And on the other side, we have the pirates. And the pirates, like any criminal organization, they are looking for a profitable business. In that case, we are talking about the $150 billion market. So for sure, it's interesting and profitable for the pirates. And on top of that, he's the only one today who can provide this user experience aggregating all the content under the same application at a very reasonable price. On top of that, we are entering a new piracy era. With new attacks, today hackers can restring the content via the HDMI, benefiting from a vulnerability in the HDCP protocol. They would use cyber attacks to attack the platform and have access to the content. Credential sharing is also a new threat for the industry. We all know people who are sharing their password, loading password with friends and siblings, but also pirates who are stealing passwords and selling it on the black market. And VPN, VPN sorry, and DNS proxies are more and more used also to circumvent geo-restricted content. Then we have neurodistribution, cheap and reliable redistribution on all screens via OTT. So again, the pirates are also benefiting from the cheap price that we see now on the OTT market, cheap on the storage, on the CDN, etc. And they can use it to redistribute their content, either by using existing social network platform like YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, or by creating their own distribution channel. And they have new and very attract attractive and aggressive business models. So here we have this example of Vulka TV. Um, for 45 euros per year, you can subscribe directly from their website. You will find their preloaded setup box with all the different channels, all the VOD content on Alibaba, on eBay. And of course, uh, for that amount of money, you will have access to an application on the tablet, on the PC, on a set-up box and on the mobile device with all the channels and all the VOD under the same application. As a consequence of that, uh, of course, we see a revenue loss, big revenue loss. Uh, so here you see in the US, um, the revenue loss associated with digital piracy is estimated between 29 billion and 70 billion dollars. Game of Thrones, we have to talk about Game of Thrones. It's the last year we can we can talk about it. Um, so the first day of the release of the season eight, we saw 50 million illegal views uh, on, on uh, Pirates platforms. And this uh, is coming from Beansport. Uh, so they share these figures uh, and they claim that they are today losing more than 400 million euros only for friends because of streaming. And the loss, of course, worldwide is it's much bigger than that. So what can you do? When you have a valuable asset such as gold, such as money, what you will do is that you will put it in a safe deposit. But you know that a safe deposit alone is not enough. So this is why you will have this safe deposit in a bank, where you have security staff, you will have cameras, sensors, alarms, etc. So basically, for video content, it's the same. Your value is definitely your content. It has 
high value. So you need to put it in your deposit and the put deposit is the conditional access system or the digital right management, but it's not enough. And this is where you need to have a strong anti-piracy strategy. So now I'm going to leave the floor to Guillaume to explain uh, how to build this, this effective anti-piracy strategy. Thanks, Kevin. I think that was a great um, overview of the uh, current market trends, the scale of the piracy issue and the techniques used by pirates to create a compelling piracy offer. So, Guillaume, turning to you, um, Kevin mentioned in the last slide uh, the need for a customized anti-piracy strategy. Can you take, uh, take that forward and elaborate on it? Well, thank you very much, Trot, for this transition. And Kevin, once again, thank you very much for showing us the scale of this issue. So as you said, piracy has become a strategic issue now for any media company. So we are going to dig into that and we are going to try to understand how we could put together a good strategy. Well, here at VO, we really believe that anti-piracy strategies should be customized based on companies' objectives. And I think it's fair to say that when we speak with people in the industry, there is overall a willingness to fight piracy. Uh, but the more we dig into that, the more we tend to realize by, act by the fact that this is actually driven by companies' objectives, and the more we also realize that these objectives are not exactly the same across the industry. A couple of examples. If we think about a sport league, the objectives are not the same than a pay TV platform. A full UTT platform may not have also the same business objectives than a traditional pay TV channel. So, before talking about the strategies, let's have a look at an approach that we have uh, thought about here at VO based on three steps. And these three steps are going to be assess, monitor, and remediate. And let's see how the objectives that I was referring to just earlier fit into this process. The first stage that we call assessment, it's about performing a risk assessment, and we came up with five watts. Uh, questions to help understand the piracy issue and as a consequence that's going to help us define a good strategy. The first one is what are the business and security objectives? So as I said earlier, business objectives varies across the industry. For right holders, anti-piracy, it's more about guaranteeing to their licensee that there is an exclusivity which exists and that their licensee are going to get a return on their investment and uh, that they just keep on acquiring. Uh, most of the time, it's going to be at a quite high price if this exclusivity is granted. So basically, it's about managing piracy uh, so that it doesn't prevent or damage content licensing. On the other hand, for an operator, anti-piracy, it's more about making sure that subscribers do not churn to piracy, that when they acquire content, it's not heavily pirated, so that it's exclusive, and that it's acquired at a fair price to get a good return on investment. Um, so we can see that piracy can become sometimes a card to play uh, during negotiation between right holders and operators, um, sometimes to increase the value of the content on one end. On the other end, it's more about decreasing it to get a good deal. And piracy comes more, if, more and more into this sort of, discussion, of discussions. Uh, last but not least, for an operator, it can also be about ensuring that contractual obligations around content protections are met, obviously, because they exist. In terms of security objectives, it's um, about ensuring that content acquire or license is effectively protected and systems, and we can think about storage, distribution system, devices are secured in case of an attack. It can also be about determining where piracy is coming from in terms of operators, in terms of devices, or in terms of pirating subscriber. But we're going to get into that a bit later. It's also often about making it very hard for the overall population to find and consume pirated content. So let's move to question two. What are the threats? From a business point of view, for an operator, the big threat is to lose rights due to piracy, just for the fact that they cannot control it. Obviously, losing subscribers, increasing charge, all that can end up badly in terms of financial uh, situation uh, when running an acquisition cost gets higher than the revenues. For a right holder, it's a bit different. 
piracy basically degrades the value of the content, the return on investment. Um, so at the end of the day, it's less revenues because the value of the content is basically degraded. And we can see that in some markets, it's becoming difficult to license content. We've seen that in the Middle East recently. If we look at this from a security point of view, threats are more about theft of content, access to consumer data, and uh, we can also think about cyber attacks on businesses. Question three, what do I want to protect? So in this seminar, we're talking about content, but this content can be live, it can be VOD, it can be premium, basic, sports, general entertainment. So depending on this content, the strategy, and the technologies that uh, we are going to recommend may be different. What is question four? What is the expected robustness? Uh, so I think it's fair to say, based on what we have seen in the industry over the last maybe 20 years, that a security solution is going to be breached at some point. So here, in terms of robustness, it's about defining the effort that it takes in terms of time, resources, expertise, to break a security solution. But what we think is even more important is um, determining the next steps when a solution is broken. Renewability is key here, and we are going to uh, talk about that more in the coming slides. Last point, last what, what can I leverage? Uh, well, here it really depends on who you are. If you are an operator, you have access and you can control your devices. So you can review your distribution strategy for devices, for third-party distribution. You can identify weak points. Uh, third-party distribution is obviously more complicated to control, so it's definitely something you can look at. You can look at how pirates pirate your platform, which device are they using, which commercial offer. You have leverage on that. On the commercial offers offered by pay TV platform, you have to realize that it's quite common these days to offer free trial period or set the bar very low in terms of cost to access premium content. So that means that it's cheap for a subscriber to subscribe, but also very cheap for a pirate to pirate you. So it's definitely something to look at and it can be a good leverage uh, to study. Sorry. So for an operator, uh, I would say that they can reinforce their security requirements at quite a lot of levels and not just the device only. It has to be a 360 degree approach. If you don't do that, you're kind of leaving a red ca carpet to the pirates. If you are a right holder, it's a bit different because you don't control the distribution on your network. Your content is distributed by others, so you have limited option. It doesn't mean that you can't do anything. Uh, for instance, you can set and leverage contractual obligation with your licensee. You can impose some anti-piracy technology. You can also determine where piracy is occurring, which distributor is leaking your content, and you can take action when you know. So that was a very long slide, so I hope that you're still with us. Uh, let's carry on and look at uh, the next section, which is about monitoring. So to execute your strategy, based on the assessment that we just did with the five what's question, you need some data. You cannot go to a distributor and say that content is leaking from its platform if you don't have any data to sustain that. You cannot also determine the right price for an SS if you don't know if it's pirated or not and to which level. That's why monitoring is key, and we believe that it should be done at two levels. At a content level, by monitoring pirated content on as much media as possible, the internet obviously, UGCs, illegal setup boxes, social media, and so on. And these data are going to confirm your threats and possibly enable your strategy. You also need to monitor your platform in terms of well, pure security uh, and to make sure that all the steps in your distribution workflow are secured. So it's about your network, your CAS, your DRM, behavior of your devices on the network and so on. Remediate, finally we get to the third stage. Uh, so just like in step one, which was the assessment, the abilities to remediate differ for a right holder DMCA notices are popular. 
Uh, it's also possible to look at the possibility to block IPs or domains in certain countries, and that's pretty efficient. IP blocking, I would say, is definitely something works, worth lobbying for. Uh, we see more and more countries where it's becoming feasible, sometimes through administrative actions without having to go to the court, which is a good thing. Uh, also, once you have identified a pirating service and you've done some investigation on individuals running the operation, there's obviously the possibility to take that to the next level by uh, trying to do some legal actions against this individual. So I would say that all that is also true for an operator, but obviously an operator has more control over the devices and systems. Uh, remediation could be through the CAS, DRM's countermeasure. It could be through added security on the platform. It could be about tracing leaks and takes appropriate action. And by that, we are thinking about terminating a subscription, taking legal actions against a subscriber, and maybe put this pirating subscriber on a blacklist so that he doesn't subscribe and pirate again the same content. So we went through the assessment, the monitoring, remediation. To do all that, you need some data, and you need uh, an anti-piracy intelligence. So basically, it's a broad knowledge uh, about threats for a broadcaster, a right holder, knowledge about pirating websites, about illegal set of boxes, social media groups to monitor, and so on. Uh, so it has to be rich. I would also say that this intelligence can be built in-house. Uh, you can quite easily, in some instances, identify weak points in your distribution chain. If you identify a pirate on your network, you can blacklist him. That's quite easy to do. Uh, yeah. So we went through the steps. Uh, we think at VO that they're important to assess the piracy issue and to help build a strategy. So obviously, there's no magic here. To do that, to build a strategy, you need to have some tools. And this is what we're going to describe now. All right. The first one which comes to mind is R, CAS, and DRMs. So it's a must-have to secure distribution deals, and to manage subscriber entertainment. It's mandated by right holder. It's really necessary as it secures distribution between the head end and the receiving devices through a level of encryption. It's a must have, but today, as Kevin explained earlier, we think that it's not enough if, we, uh, if you think again about this uh, bank and safe analogy. Watermarking. It allows you to determine the source of a leak through invisible mark. It's very useful. It has become a key, t a key tool uh, in efficient strategy. We are going to get into that in a minute. Piracy monitoring and enforcement. So this is necessary to quantify piracy and overall reduce the piracy level through enforcement. It's not a simple process, as you probably all know, Removing a link from the internet can take a lot of time. You have to deal with the non-compliance issues and so on. But anyway, it's a very good tool to use. And the data that you collect on illegal services, websites, cyber lockers, and so on, really help you create a piracy intelligence. And at the end of the day, are going to enable, allow you to enable your strategy. Legal action and investigation. So we are going to speak about watermarking soon. But I would say that when you have identified a pirating subscriber, considering a legal action definitely makes sense. Uh, we've seen that judgments can be good. Uh, and actually doing a good PR around it can sometimes be beneficial and deter pirates from considering pirating your content. So we are not going to speak a lot in the webinar about commercial piracy by that I mean people using residential subscription in public viewing properties, bars, and clubs. But obviously, uh, if you want to speak about that, you can get in touch with us. SOC for media. So we are going to speak about that in a minute. Uh, but overall, it's about analyzing data from a platform, like networking data, subscriber data, to detect anomaly and unusual pattern. Password sharing identification. Well, that has been in the news recently. 
uh, we've seen that in the US there are several direct-to-consumer OTT platforms which are launching these days and password sharing comes back in the news. Uh, Geoblocking and VPN detection. So these are usually mandated by right holder to enforce territorial licensing restriction. It's a must have, obviously. And finally, these tools can be complemented with overall general consumer education and collaboration within the industry. Uh, there are anti-piracy groups out there who collaborate on piracy intelligence, joint legal actions, lobbying for IP blocking, setting up code of ethics, uh, with social media platform or search, search engine, and the list goes on. So let's do a use case now related to protection of live sport. We have reviewed the tools available today to address piracy, and uh, let's dig by using this use case. So the use case is quite simple. It's about a pay TV platform broadcasting premium live content, and this platform is losing subscriber. Piracy is determined to be an important contributor for these losses. The five what's. So what are the business and security objectives? So it's about stopping subscriber losses, secure the platform with appropriate anti-piracy tools. Oops, sorry. I'm going to back there. Uh, two, what are the threats? Unfair competition from pirated services, risk of losing distribution rights, and possibly financial troubles. What do I want to protect? Well, here it's live sports. What is the expected robustness? I would say it's high, but more importantly, it has to be renewable. What can I leverage? Uh, so in this case, I can leverage the control of the distribution networks and devices, control of the subscriber database, control of pay TV commercial offers. So considering this assessment, we think that watermarking is a good tool to help define a good strategy in this context. Of course, it has to be complemented with what we talked about before, like CAS and DRMs, monitoring, potentially legal action, pretty much all the toolbox uh, makes sense here. So what is watermarking and what are the key features? So before going into the list, just a warning, platforms which have card sharing issues today can deploy watermarking, but the power of the solution will not be maximized for uh, obvious reasons. So the purpose and the key feature, it's about determining the source of a content leak. You have, that can be a subscriber device, and we're talking about subscriber or client watermark, or it can be about the distributor. If we think about a league distributing content across multiple platforms, that's a distribution watermark. It has to be invisible. Uh, we believe it has to be dynamic, renewable, robust, fast, and last but not least, device, network, cast, DRM agnostic. It has to be an easy solution to deploy. So let's have a look at a diagram to uh, show the way it works. So it all starts in the operation room where an operator will decide to activate the watermarking on the network. This is the step one that you can see here. Usually it's done through CAS and DRM's commands, but activation or deactivation is not limited to that. The command has to reach all the devices on the network, set up boxes or non set up boxes devices like phones or tablets or game consoles. And I would insist on the fact that the deployment has to be comprehensive across the network, so all the devices, so that it becomes efficient. So an invisible mark identifying the device is added on the video output of these devices. So as I said, if you want to make sure that when you implement this strategy, you want to make sure that card sharing uh, do not exist on your platform. Otherwise, it's not, the efficiency will not be maximized. Um, so now we're going to move to the pirates, which is what you see here, and that's the pirates infrastructure. So basically, typically, pirates will record and redistribute the HDMI output of these devices, as you can see here. So this is in the open, and you have to monitor that. We talked about monitoring earlier. Well, it's obviously necessary to monitor the game, the football game that you're considering, across a wide range of pirate services. We do that at Vero through Ion Piracy Services, and this is the step two here. Step three, 
Each uh, video is recorded for a short time and the mark is extracted as you can see here. This then goes back to the operation room and uh, the operator has the ability to revoke device as we ca you can see in the slide in front of you. The key point is renewability. Um, so if the mark is compromised or any kind of mechanism in the diagram, it's very important to be able to renew that and make the watermarking work again. What's next? So we tend to realize that um, if you do that, as I just explained, it kind of works. But at the same time, pirate, pirate feed may come back, and very often it will. Pirates are clever. They've got some backup. Uh, they know that their feed may be disconnected, so it will come back. And what we uh, want to think about is how do we go beyond, beyond that? So when an account is terminated, what's next? Uh, you tend to realize that these days, when you use this technology, uh, you're going to identify accounts, and very often it's not individuals, because it's very easy to subscribe to a pay TV platform, uh, and actually it's very easy to do that anonymously. So you end up identifying accounts, and uh, you disconnect that, and then you identify another account, but you don't have information about individuals to, um, to carry on and to take legal actions, for instance. So we are going to focus now on Security Operations Center that we call SOC for medias. And the idea here is to leverage operators' data to detect abnormal behavior in the whole customer acquisition and video delivery, delivery chain. So we want to make sure that the data that uh, are entered in the CRM system are accurate, and they are, if they are not, that we can uh, find some and flag some anomalies, which may be pirates, and the same applies to the very video delivery chain. So the abnormal behavior that I was referring to could be about fake customer accounts with incomplete data, invalid data, redundancy in CRMs. It's quite usual to see multiple times the same phone number, for instance, appearing, the same postcode, and so on. Some attacks on devices, like um, an unusual activity rate. So if a device asks um, hundreds of DRM licenses at the same time, it doesn't make sense. Introduction to the backend, subscription of content redistribution. If you have some devices which are on the same channels for days, that may be suspicious. And credential sharing and clone detection. So for the interest of time, I'm not going to go into this slide, but we can see here some tools that we have at VIO. On the top, you can see some um, activity monitoring with some unusual pattern on the right. Uh, you can also see uh, some anomalies that we try to detect. And uh, on the right, it's more about um, uh, credential sharing, uh, where we can we try to flag accounts uh, doing this sort of things. All right. Thanks very much, Guillaume, for, for those insights. Um, I think the use case around protection of live sports was particularly interesting. And it clearly makes sense to define anti-piracy strategies around business objectives, and obviously those may differ from for sports leagues or, or studios or, or for TV operators. So, Kevin, turning back to you, more generally, where are we heading? How do you see piracy overall uh, evolve in, in the coming years? Yeah, so thank you, Stuart. So, yes, before ending, we'll take few minutes to uh, talk about the future trends, trends so what's ahead of us, and um, also maybe take some time to sum up what we have presented today. Um, so we have two kinds of future trends. We are more some of, on the content protection side, and, and the others are more for piracy. So for the content protection, we will have new content, content formats to protect. I mean, we are already talking about AR, VR, MR. These formats, they come with different security constraints. They come with different security requirements. Uh, like, for instance, uh, in the case of VR, the need to process the video in a secure context on a GPU, which was not really designed for that. So, of course, the protection will have to adapt to these new formats. Then we have, on the piracy side, we have, uh, uh, we'll see more and more counterfeit channels. Um, VR2 is one of the most famous examples. Um, BLQ, they were not only just redistributing the channels from Beansport, they were also cherry picking 
content from different providers to build their own channels. We see more and more private applications who are doing the same, and we believe it's going to be a big trend in, in the future. Also, we see a move from the open piracy to closed piracy, um, meaning that to have access to pirate links, to have access to the videos, end user will have to subscribe to packages, would have to be a member of a WhatsApp group or Telegram group. So it's going to make it more difficult for um, the crawlers and all the anti-piracy tools to find uh, the content that we are looking for. And the last one is, of course, piracy is evolving with time. Um, the pirates, they, they have always new ways to attack the content, to get the keys, uh, redistribute the video, etc. So we'll see new hacking techniques. And, and one example uh, in the AI field, so Guillaume was mentioning uh, the SOC for media, where we are collecting the data and trying to detect suspicious behaviors. In AI, we already see some kind of attacks called adversarial attacks. Um, so this kind of attacks aims at um, confusing the uh, machine learning algorithm and make it see or not see uh, things. So for sure, uh, these kind of attacks will be also used in the media space. So what are the four lessons that you need to take with you after this webinar? So first of all, there is no one size fits all strategy. Really, before doing anything else uh, or asking your technical team to buy you know, one solution or another, start by answering the five word questions. This is really important if you want to build uh, an effective anti piracy strategy. Then there is no silver bullet. Um, I mean, there is no single tool that can address all different forms of piracy. So it's really the way you will combine all these tools according to the strategy that you have defined will make it effect effective. Then anti-piracy requires a holistic approach. You need to involve everyone at every level of the company. Um, like the way you're going to manage your customers and the data you will have checked on these specific customers will have you, will help you when, when you are facing piracy. Uh, the way you will manage the commercial offers, if you offer a one month free trial today to one customer, it's the same one month free trial that you offer, that you will offer to the pirates. And, and for sure, for him, it's helpful. And all, again, to quote uh, Mr. Alobaili, he said during the same conference that piracy was a topic which has moved from the CTO desk to the CEO desk for the last years. And the last one is for sure tomorrow's issues will be different than today's. So what is true today will be probably different uh, uh, later. So we need to constantly adapt. You need to adapt your tools, you need to renew your tools uh, in order to be able to face piracy. So that's it for us. Uh, I hope, uh, yeah, Stuart, go ahead, sorry. Thanks very much, Kevin, That's, uh, and thanks also, Guillaume, for, uh, for a very interesting uh, double presentation. Um, so we're now going to move on to the uh, Q&A. Um, a few of you have already submitted questions, and please um, keep those questions coming in. Um, also, can I ask you please to take a moment to answer the feedback form that appears at the bottom of your screen uh, before the end. So, uh, and just as for the moment, keep those questions coming in. So, so Guillaume, uh, to start, you mentioned that watermarking is hard to deploy where there's card sharing piracy happening. Um, can you please elaborate on that? Sure. So when you have some card sharing issues, it means that uh, a non-legitimate setter box is able to decrypt content from a satellite or cable feed, which is being encrypted. So it's basically not the legitimate setter box, which may be used for piracy. And, uh, and it also means that this non-legitimate setter box may not have all the tools that you deploy on your park of setter boxes, like watermarking. So basically, instead of using the official box to decrypt content, pirates are going, are going to use another box, which is equipped with card sharing functionalities to uh, bypass uh, the watermarking and redistribute content. Great. 
Um, just as a follow-up to that, so watermarking must be deployed across all devices to reduce the chances of piracy occurring from non-watermark devices. Is there a way to prioritize deployment across set-top boxes and OTT devices? Um, so I, I would say yes. Uh, what we tend to see is that for um, operators having set up boxes and tablets and phones and connected uh, TVs and, and the list goes on, uh, the, site, uh, the set up box is very often used as the box to um, hack, to redistribute content. It's because it's easier. There is an HTMI output, uh, so it's easy to do. It's stable as opposed to OTT distribution. So I'm referring to satellite and cable delivery. So it has become the primary target uh, for HDMI redistribution. So set the box, yes. I would also say that when you have uh, watermarking or any other kinds of um, device identification technology, you can uh, try to do some stats and build some data around that. So the more you uh, progress, the more you can, you may see some patterns like which box, which zappers, which PVR is being used uh, the more often to pirate you. And what we have seen is that, uh, well, pirates are, they are clever. If you have a cheap set of box on the market, it's what they're going to use. So in terms of, uh, to answer your question, finally, I would say that looking at the cheapest zapper which is available on your commercial offer is uh, definitely something to start with. Great, thanks very much for, for that. Um, so we have a question now I can see from, uh, from a press and analyst, so Tommy Flanagan at Rethink Research. Um, he wants to ask if operators can easily build anti-piracy intelligence in the house, then what does VO bring to the fight? Um, yes, so I'm not sure we, we say that this, it was easy to build an anti-piracy intelligence, or maybe you, you say it, Guillaume. Uh, definitely it's not. Uh, I mean, it takes some time and, and resources uh, first to, you know, have a good view of all the different uh, uh, websites, this reading content, the different IPTV offers. Then sometimes we need to do more than that and, and, and really see what's behind the, just the offer that you will find on the internet, but, but more run some technical investigations. Um, again, to get really good knowledge, you also need to uh, uh, take the time to you know, register on the forums. Uh, most of the forums will exchange information on uh, illegal uh, uh, redistribution of content. We'll first you know, uh, ask at a certain level uh, of, uh, 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 of reward, I would say, uh, to have access to uh, confidential information. So. No, definitely it's it's not easy. It's something that you have to have uh, if you want to be effective on the strategy, on the monitoring, on the remediation, but it, it's complex to build. Okay, thanks for that. Um, we also have another question from Hervé Kreff at Broadpeak. What uh, could be the differences between different watermarking solutions? Uh, Hervé wants to know. Um. So yeah, there's a, a few watermarking solutions out there. Uh, you have some which are more client-based, so the watermarking is added by the receiving device, which can be a set-up box or um, which can be a non-set-up box devices like a smartphones. Uh, on the other hand, you have uh, solutions which uh, works at the head end level or CDN level. So the watermarking is, so it's not going to be added there, but you have a, a set of uh, video streams and the client will basically um, use patterns to uh, create a watermark uh, when outputted content. So one is more client-based, the other one is more um, head-end-based. Uh, what is key here for us is to look at uh, the robustness of that solution against uh, well, degradation of the images, potentially collusions, which are being used more and more often. And as I said in the speech, uh, reliability is really a key factor because we think that we're talking about video processing. So at some stage, uh, something may, may be broken. So having the ability to fix that by uh, deploying other patterns, other algorithms, is um, 
whichever the solution, it's it, it's something key for us that we think will make a difference. Thanks for that. Um, so another question: How does one deal? This one is from uh, Akash Ahulalia at Z Entertainment. How does one deal with issues where pirates are able to mask the watermark or fingerprinting? that is being output in the original video data stream by the broadcaster. I don't know which one of you guys wants to say that, Guillaume, perhaps? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. So, well, it's a bit similar to what I was saying earlier. Uh, watermarking, there's a very good chance that people will, will play with that. And the same applies to fingerprinting. And I think in this context, it means a visible code on screen. Um, pirates will play with that and will try to uh, hide them hide the fingerprint, uh, break the watermark, they will try to do that. And this is why having the ability to fix it easily without having to go rounds of OTAs across all the devices out there, which are, which is very difficult to organize, is, um, is a key factor to success. Okay, uh, thanks a lot. Um, I want to Kevin this time. Uh, you talked about IP blocking as a tool to reduce piracy. Can you please tell me a bit more about this? Um, yeah, I think it was Reza Guillaume who talked about IP blocking, but I'm happy to take the, the question. So IP blocking um, is a service that aims at blocking IP addresses of pirate servers entering on one territory so that the users from one country can no longer access the private servers or, or website or streamers. Um, this uh, would require a strong collaboration between the ISP of the country, the different ISPs, and um, the local regulation authority. Uh, although um, where it can be deployed, it has a very good efficiency. And if we take the example of uh, UK, where uh, major ISPs like uh, Sky and BT are collaborating with the local uh, authority, uh, IP blocking combined with watermarking uh, showed, I think, a decrease of piracy and, 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 and more certainly an increase of, I think it was between 7 to 12 percent in the use of legal subscription sites. Uh, so I think that that's definitely a good tool where you have the legislation to, to put it in, in, in place. Thanks, Kevin. I, I think this one may be actually for you. Um, correctly, um, is, is from Mike McKibben at Pageview. Is piracy more prevalent in certain geographical regions? Mike would like to know. So it's more prevalent in certain regions, yes. Um, but I would say it's more than that, it's different. Uh, when you go in Asia, for instance, they will use a lot, I mean, not, not South East, Southeast Asia, not all Asia, but uh, Southeast Asia, they will use a lot um, the um, uh, social networks. So we'll find a lot of videos on YouTube and Facebook. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so we pirated content. Um, then if you go to China, you will find more peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, for instance. Uh, if you go to Western Europe, you will have more streaming. Uh, streaming is definitely more popular than peer-to-peer than -peer these days. Uh, so, yeah, we have some, some uh, regions that are, uh, let's say, uh, uh, where the legislation is less restrictive, so you will find more piracy. Uh, but more importantly, I, mean, I think it's, it's really different depending on the country. It's not the same piracy. Okay, um, thanks a lot. Next question um, is from Willis Pelligan at WCG. Are there any specific strategies to utilize to thwart piracy originating physical media such as DVDs? Um, um, so, which one are you going to Yeah, I'm happy to take that one. So, um, well, for DVDs, it really depends. Um, if it's a copy of an original DVD, uh, then it's actually very hard to uh, to know where the leak is coming from. But we've seen in some markets, uh, especially in the Middle East, that uh, you have people recording shows on TVs, um, burning that on a DVD and selling that in shops. In this context, uh, watermarking definitely makes sense, and you can identify... Um, the device which has been used to create that DVD. And if uh, the thing that I talked about earlier about uh, good consumer data in a CRM and accurate customer data uh, is correctly implemented, 
you may have a chance to find who is actually doing this uh, well, the recording and the burning of DVDs. So watermarking can work uh, even for physical medias. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Graham. Um, so with that, um, I think we've just about run out of time. So I'd, I'd like to thank uh, both the presenters once again, uh, Guillaume Forbin and Kevin Lejanic, for an outstanding presentation. Um, we'd also like to thank Viaxis Orca for sponsoring today's event. And on behalf of Digital TV Europe, thanks for joining us and, and have a productive remainder of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.